In the high-stakes arena of finance, one hedge fund stands out as exceptionally profitable. Citadel, led by a man known not only for his unparalleled trading strategy, but also for his lavish lifestyle. Ken Griffin. While most investors and traders strive merely to beat the market, Griffin and his firm have gone a step further, essentially becoming synonymous with the market itself. As a result, Citadel rakes in billions. Raised in Boca Raton, Florida, Ken Griffin's childhood is anything but ordinary. His father, an executive at General Electric, plays a significant role in his early life. Demonstrating exceptional mathematical skills from a young age, Ken rapidly becomes the president of his high school's math club, showcasing his aptitude and leadership. Of all these successful hedge fund managers, most of them are good at numbers and statistics. But Ken Griffin's ambitions extend beyond academics. Driven by a dream of excelling in the business world, he embarks on an entrepreneurial journey while still in high school. From the confines of his bedroom, he launches a small venture, selling educational software. I had a, I had a business in high school that distributed software. Real, real fascination with commercial enterprises. This early foray into business lays the foundational stones for what will become a remarkable journey to success in his future endeavors. With outstanding academic achievements, Griffin secures admission to Harvard College. They were, they were thrilled that I went to Harvard. Graduate. My parents said graduate. And part of that was my parents knew I loved business. And I think they really wanted me to focus on my studies and then pursue a career. And I was, I was really looking forward to pursuing my career. But college life alone doesn't satisfy him. He's eager to start making money. Griffin turns his attention to trading as a means to understand the market better. And soon, he discovers his first investment opportunity. And I tell you, it's very safe, it's durable, and Girl, it's lightweight. you're scaring me. So oh, really? <laughs> See, Whoa. now it's locked in place, okay? In the late 1980s, the Home Shopping Network is a booming televised home shopping business. It revolutionizes the retail industry with its live broadcast format, offering an array of products ranging from jewelry to home goods. This approach, combined with engaging hosts and limited time deals, exploits the expanding cable television network and reshapes consumer habits. But with every booming business comes the risk of a bubble. After reading about a Forbes article on the company, Griffin discerns the company's excessive overvaluation. He sees a lucrative opportunity in shorting the company's stock. The problem is, he doesn't know how to do a short selling. Griffin diligently studies finance textbooks to grasp the concept. He concludes that purchasing a put option is the most effective strategy for shorting the stock. When you buy insurance on your house, it's like buying a put option on your house. Although it may be not directly connected to the home's value, but right? When you buy an insurance policy on your house and the house burns down, you collect on the insurance policy. Uh, well, the price of your house fell to zero. If you had bought a put option on the house, it would do the same thing, right? You, you would have an uh, option to sell it at a high price, uh, something that's not worthless. So uh, an, uh, insurance is like options, and insurance gives you peace of mind. Griffin's first investment is a triumph. Between March 1987 and March 1988, HSN's stock price falls by 18.95%. Utilizing the put option to bet against HSN's stock, Griffin, merely a college freshman, earns a profit of $5,000. This early success in trading options sparks Griffin's realization of the potential in derivatives. While still pursuing his college education, he begins launching his own fund, concentrating on convertible bonds. But convertible bonds like regular 
uh, company debt that pays interest, but you can switch it for company stock. Say a company gives you a bond worth $1,000 and you can trade it for 50 shares of their stock. You do this if the stock's price goes up and it's a better deal. It's your choice when to make the swap during the bond's life. Griffin soon develops a strategy that capitalizes on a systematic inefficiency in the convertible bonds market. My strategy was mainly called convertible arbitrage. I would search for convertible bonds that are priced inefficiently compared to the underlying stock. I would then buy these undervalued convertible bonds and simultaneously short the corresponding stock. This is to hedge against market fluctuations. Over time, if the bond's price aligns closer to its true value relative to the stock, I profit from this convergence. Ken Griffin's strategy is a massive success. By the time he graduates Harvard, he is already making hundreds of thousands of profit trading for himself. But he knows, to truly grow his wealth, he will need an investor with real money. The 1990s in the US are a decade of an economic boom, with robust growth, low unemployment, and mild inflation. Technological advancements, particularly in the dot-com sector, fuel much of this growth, ushering in the longest period of economic expansion in peacetime, accompanied by a soaring stock market. Amidst this thriving decade, the hedge fund industry witnesses substantial growth and transformation. The economic prosperity and a booming stock market create an ideal environment for hedge funds, attracting investors with the allure of high returns and effective risk management strategies. With Meyer's assistance, Griffin builds Citadel into a dynamic hedge fund, focusing on derivative trading and capitalizing on market opportunities. During the 1990s, Citadel experiences phenomenal growth. By 2001, the fund consistently outperforms the market index, boasting annual returns of around 40% and managing over $2 billion in assets. But now, Ken Griffin faces a problem. So, with more competition in hedge funds, there's a tighter squeeze on performance and management fees. Every fund's feeling the heat to perform better. Also, when the fund gets really big, it can push down the profits from arbitrage trades. Basically, making money from the original strategy gets tougher when your investment's size increases. To maintain his edge over the competition, Griffin is on the hunt for a new strategy, one that will sustain profits for years to come while minimizing volatility. And he soon discovers the potential in security service as a lucrative venture. But in spite of this brilliant idea, Citadel Securities is slow to start. Well, you gotta ask yourself, in five years, will this business be more relevant or less relevant than it is today? Uh, and if there's no competition, that's a good thing, but you gotta be careful always that, uh, that you're not too early. Timing has a lot to do with success. For years since its inception, Citadel Securities struggled to grow. Unbeknownst to Griffin, this securities venture is about to become a minor concern compared to a looming crisis. The country is on the brink of the most severe financial crash in recent history. Right now we're sitting down 875 points. We've now broken uh, Dow 10,000. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped more than 900 points. The market didn't work. It broke down. The machines broke down. Fear came back into the market in a very big way. In the years leading up to 2008, the financial landscape is rife with high-risk mortgage lending, the securitization of unstable mortgages, and a housing bubble inflated by speculative investments. As banks start to falter, the hedge fund industry faces even graver challenges. The crisis triggers a surge in investor redemptions, compelling many hedge funds to offload assets at devalued prices. Thus, intensifying their losses. Among the hedge funds that suffer severe losses is Citadel. 
One of the world's largest hedge fund managers, Citadel Investment Group, told clients today that two of its main funds have lost 35% of their value this year after rumors swept the market about its financial position. The Chicago-based firm, which has $20 billion of funds under management, blamed panic and dislocation on global exchanges for its predicament. Citadel is run by 40-year-old billionaire Kenneth Griffin, an investment prodigy who got married in the gardens of France's Versailles Palace, and who once spent a reported $60 million on a Cezanne painting. One of my competitors put his list out of the five firms most likely to go bankrupt. I was on that list of five. Citadel finished 2008 down 55 percent. But Ken Griffin realizes this as a turning point, seizing the opportunity to acquire securities at low prices, anticipating a substantial recovery. He also observes that, as other investment banks strive to recuperate, a window opens for Citadel Securities to venture into the investment banking sector. And by the end of 2009, Citadel issued its first bond. But Griffin has to face the complexities of breaking into investment banking. He recognizes that automating and scaling this sector is challenging due to its resource-intensive nature, requiring substantial capital, skilled personnel, and specialized knowledge. Operations in this field involve intricate, customized transactions, such as mergers and acquisitions, and initial public offerings, IPOs, necessitating hands-on expertise and bespoke strategies. Citadel Chief gives up dream for investment bank. Three years and millions of dollars later, Kenneth C. Griffin is abandoning his quest. Mr. Griffin is now trying to sell Citadel's investment bank to focus on electronic trading in his securities division, a person close to the firm said. Despite the challenges in investment banking, Ken Griffin relentlessly explores new business avenues beyond the volatility of trading. Post-2010, he observes an uptick in retail investor engagement and greater market participation. Seizing this opportunity, he aims to amplify Citadel's presence in market making. A market maker is always active in the market, buying from sellers and selling to buyers. They make a tiny bit of profit by buying and selling each time. They keep the market flowing smoothly, making sure people can buy or sell fast and at a good price, no matter the market condition. They are providing liquidity to the market. For example, if you want to sell a stock quickly, a market maker is there to buy it from you, even if no one else wants to buy at that moment. Griffin understands that in the vast casino of the market, market makers act as the house. By venturing into this realm, he envisions Citadel transforming into the house itself, thereby positioning the firm for long-term, consistent profits. Citadel Securities will primarily make money by continuously setting buy and sell prices for financial instruments and profiting from the bid-ask spread. They use advanced tech and algorithms for efficient pricing and trade execution. Known for high-frequency trading, the firm executes numerous trades quickly, profiting from small market inefficiencies. While Ken Griffin's Citadel has found its new strategic direction, meanwhile, 2,200 miles away in Silicon Valley, a fintech startup is set to revolutionize the industry. Led by two visionary entrepreneurs, Vladimir Tenev and Baiju Bhatt are committed to transforming the brokerage business. They champion the idea that the stock market should be accessible to all, not just the affluent or seasoned investors, advocating for democratized financial market access. At the time, the stock trading landscape was largely dominated by traditional brokerage firms. These firms typically charged per-trade commissions, which could be significant and thus a barrier for smaller retail investors. The process of trading was often seen as complex and intimidating, especially for young or inexperienced investors. Tanev and Pot also recognized the rapid growth in smartphone use and mobile app adoption. 
a trend largely overlooked by the financial sector. With many brokerage services, still tethered to web-based platforms with minimal mobile capabilities, they see an unmet need. They envision a new kind of brokerage that offers free commissions, where users can buy and sell without the burden of percentage fees. But the problem is, without commissions, they will have to find a new way of making money. When Robinhood was founded in 2013, the goal was to encourage younger people who generally don't have a lot of money to try investing. But it wasn't initially clear how the app would make money without charging commissions as traditional brokers would. But soon, 10F and Bot realize that by amassing a large user base, they can profit by selling trading data to third parties. This business model is called the payment for order flow. And now, Robinhood just needs to find a market-making firm with a deep pocket to do business with. Following the collapse of his investment bank, Ken Griffin's Citadel Securities struggles to gain a competitive edge. But his luck will soon change, as Robinhood comes calling. They form a partnership where Robinhood Securities receives payments from Citadel Execution Services for directing equity order flow to them. In turn, Citadel Securities profits from each trade. When individual investors place their trade orders at Robinhood, instead of executing this trade on a public exchange like the New York Stock Exchange, the brokerage firm routes these orders to a market maker such as Citadel Securities market makers, receive the order flow and execute these orders. They profit from the spread which is the difference between the buy and sell price of a security. The business model for Robinhood is genius, and finance is never the same. From 2015 to 2019, the securities and brokerage industry experienced significant growth. Influenced by a conducive economic environment, interest rates remained relatively low, fostering an attractive climate for investment and borrowing. Labor participation showed gradual improvement, reflecting a strengthening economy. With the increasing amount of market participation, the brokerage industry, particularly with the advent of fintech and platforms like Robinhood, saw an influx of new investors, thanks to user-friendly interfaces and reduced barriers to entry like commission-free trading. Its partnership with Citadel Securities allows both firms rake in billions of revenue but slowly, the market begins to catch on with what Robinhood is doing. Robinhood Markets Inc. has built a reputation on its origins in finance counterculture and a steal from the rich ethos. But the firm, which offers no fee stock trading, is making almost half its revenue from one of the most controversial practices on Wall Street. The startup, valued at $5.6 billion, was bringing in more than 40% of its revenue earlier this year from selling its customers' orders to high-frequency trading firms, or market makers like Citadel Securities. But this is just the beginning. As year of 2020 dawns, Robinhood and Citadel brace for their biggest challenge yet. And it will come from an unlikely place. In the early 2000s, GameStop stands as a titan in the world of video game retail. Originating in the 1980s, the company grows into a global network of thousands of stores a haven for gamers seeking the latest releases, classic titles, and gaming gear. But as the digital age advances, GameStop's physical retail model starts to age. The rise of online gaming stores, direct downloads, and streaming services begins to overshadow the need for physical game copies, leading to a gradual decline in GameStop's relevance and profitability. Amid these challenges, Wall Street analysts and investors cast doubtful eyes on GameStop's future. The company's falling sales, underperforming stock, and the industry's shift toward digital distribution paint a bleak picture. This sentiment spurs a growing interest in short-selling the company's stock, betting on a continued price fall. Major hedge funds and institutional investors heavily short-sell GameStop, anticipating that the company's declining fortunes will reflect in its stock price But one man, 
Keith Gill sees it differently. Believing that Wall Street might be overly pessimistic, he decides to invest everything he has in GameStop stock. Keith Gill, known online as Roaring Kitty on YouTube and Deep F Ing Value on Reddit, is not a typical Wall Street analyst. A chartered financial analyst by training, his career includes stints in marketing and operations at startups before moving into financial services. Despite his credentials, Gill's investing approach, combining rigorous financial analysis with a firm belief in value investing, stands out. Gill's interest in GameStop sparks not at its peak, but during its lowest point. His analysis, shared on YouTube and Reddit, argues that the market undervalues GameStop's potential. He notes the company's strong balance sheet with minimal debt, the potential for a turnaround under new leadership, and the imminent release of new gaming consoles that could boost in-store traffic. Contrary to Wall Street's narrative, Gill views GameStop not as a dying retail relic, but as a company with turnaround potential. Simultaneously, a subreddit named Wall Street Bets grows. This online community, known for its irreverent tone and high-risk speculative trading, becomes a haven for retail investors disconnected from traditional finance. Led by Gill, the Wall Street Bets community decides to massively bet against Wall Street, aiming to execute a short squeeze on a particular Wall Street hedge fund. Individual investors begin to buy GameStop shares en masse and hold on to them, causing the stock price to surge. This surge proves catastrophic for hedge funds that had shorted the stock, betting on its price to fall. A short squeeze happens when a stock's price significantly rises, forcing short sellers to purchase back shares at higher prices to cover their positions. This action further drives up the stock price in a feedback loop. In late January 2021, GameStop's stock price skyrockets, fueled by a frenzy of buying from individual investors and traders. Melvin Capital, a prominent hedge fund known for short-selling strategies, faces devastating losses due to the GameStop short squeeze. Having taken a substantial short position in GameStop, the hedge fund sees its losses mount as the stock's price soars. Reports indicate that the fund loses billions of dollars, necessitating a significant capital infusion from other hedge funds, including Citadel and Point72, to stabilize its financial position. The short squeeze leads to extreme market volatility. Trading platforms, especially Robinhood, come under intense scrutiny and backlash for restricting trading in GameStop and other heavily shorted stocks at the peak of the squeeze. These actions spark outrage among investors and raise questions about market fairness and the role of brokerage platforms in individual investing. Citadel Securities, as a leading market maker in the U.S. stock market, and also as a big investor for Robinhood, plays a crucial role in executing stock trades for retail investors. As a market maker, it buys and sells securities to provide liquidity to the markets. This role becomes particularly significant during the GameStop episode due to Citadel Securities' relationship with Robinhood and other retail brokerages. The intertwining relationships between Robinhood, Citadel Securities, and Melvin Capital lead to speculation and conspiracy theories. Critics suggest that Citadel Securities might have influenced Robinhood's decision to restrict trading in GameStop, alleging a potential conflict of interest given Citadel LLC's investment in Melvin Capital. The congressional hearings that follow the GameStop short squeeze aim to unravel these complex relationships. Lawmakers grill representatives from Citadel Securities, Robinhood, and Melvin Capital on their roles and decision-making processes during the event. While no evidence of wrongdoing is found, the hearings highlight the opaque nature of the relationships between market makers, hedge funds, and brokerage platforms, raising questions about market fairness and transparency. But one thing is certain, in spite of what happened, Citadel will continue to make ungodly amount of money 